should I take medications like Ozempic or Wegovy or Manjaro are questions that I get asked quite a lot. And it's easy to see the upside to these medications. They're extremely effective for weight loss. They probably have some cardioprotective effects, but it's much more difficult to quantify the exact downsides to these medications. How common are the adverse effects? What are the potential pitfalls to these medications? So I wanted to do this video on the top five adverse effects of the GLP-1 receptor agonist that I see walk through the emergency department doors. And before we start in, I want to say that none of the following is medical advice. You should always consult with your own physician before making any health-related decisions. That brings us to adverse effect number one of the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is nausea and vomiting. This is extremely common when first starting out these medications, and it's common when experiencing a dose increase. These medications, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, are mimicking a molecule that's normally produced by our gut after we eat called GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1. That's secreted by part of the small intestine and it goes throughout the body and it signals to our brain that we are full. And it also signals to our GI tract that it's okay to slow down. And the general theme of this is that we want to decrease our intake of food and fluids. We're kind of in an oral intake rejection mode. And that's why people experience nausea, and if they continue to eat their normal intake during that time, they may experience vomiting as well. Sometimes the nausea and vomiting are transient, and sometimes they're lasting and require discontinuation of the medication or dose adjustment. But both of these can lead into the second adverse effect, which is dehydration occasionally leading into acute kidney injury. So when we're in a oral intake rejection mode, we're becoming slightly dehydrated, or in some cases, more profoundly dehydrated. And if we don't replenish those fluids, then the plasma compartment of the blood, which is primarily composed of water, will decrease in volume. So how does dehydration relate to the kidneys? Well, the kidneys normally secrete waste products into the urine in a concentrated form. And from a chemical or diffusion perspective, you can think about this as trying to roll a boulder uphill. You're going against the normal forces of nature or gravity. And it's the same thing in the kidneys trying to secrete or concentrate waste products into the urine. But when our plasma volume becomes lower and lower, the kidneys have to do a couple more things. Number one, they have to try to decrease the amount of water that they excrete into the urine to save the plasma compartment volume of water and they also increase the gradient that they're working against. Usually the way that we'll identify an acute kidney injury in the emergency department is an increase in a couple metrics called creatinine and BUN, and both of those are inversely related to renal function. That brings us into number three adverse effect of the GLP-1 receptor agonist that I see walk through the emergency department doors, and that is starvation ketosis. So normally these medications cause people to decrease their calorie intake. And when people decrease their calories, particularly in carbohydrates, they start relying upon ketones to fuel basic functions like brain function. Now, the problem is that in certain individuals, if you have a very high quantity of ketone bodies being produced, that can actually lead into an acidosis or what we call ketoacidosis. This can occur particularly in diabetes and is usually resolved with hydration and insulin but occasionally in the emergency department, you'll see someone who's on one of these medications who's had decreased PO intake for a long time, and it turns out that they're in an acidotic state and their ketones are very high. And typically what you'll have to do is slowly reintroduce food and fluids, IV hydration, supportive care, and it usually corrects itself. But it can be dangerous for some individuals. This brings us to the fourth adverse effect of the GLP-1 receptor agonist that I see walking through the emergency department doors, and that is muscle wasting, and not for the reasons that you might think. I did a video on this a while back, and I'll link to that in the description, describing the, I would say, medium quality evidence on the link between GLP-1 receptor agonist use and muscle wasting. But I'll say that from a clinical perspective, the patients that I've seen who seem to be struggling significantly with muscle wasting while on these medications, almost none of them are on a regular strength training program or any kind of other prophylactic program to prevent muscle wasting. That would also include things like protein intake and keeping track of how much protein is in the diet, making sure that that is elevated as much as it needs to be to prevent muscle wasting. 
This is critically important because without strength training regularly and without an adequate supply of protein, the kind of caloric reduction that is induced by these medications is a recipe for muscle wasting. So that's very important. And finally, the last adverse effect that I see walking through the emergency department doors while someone is on the GLP-1 receptor agonist is depressed mood. So there have been plenty of studies in the past showing that when someone is in a significant caloric deficit, their mood decreases. And that can, in fact, lead into a significant depression. The mechanism here is not entirely known, but it likely has to do with a reduction in energy expenditure through reductions in metabolic rate and the thyroid. Now, those are my top five in decreasing order of frequency that I've seen in the emergency department, but I will include an honorable mention here because it's talked about so much, and that is gastroparesis. So gastroparesis is included as a side effect of these medications. It is a known side effect. What makes it difficult to tease out in some of the research is that gastroparesis is also a known complication of diabetes. And because diabetes is the end stage of a spectrum of metabolic dysfunction, it's possible that some people develop gastroparesis-like pathology earlier in their disease than others. I have seen gastroparesis in the emergency department in patients who do not have diabetes but are primarily taking these medications for weight loss as an indication, so that's important to know about as well. With that, thank you so much for listening. If you want to support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the like button and the subscribe button. If you're on Spotify and are able to head over there, I'll leave a link in the description to leave a review or a rating. It helps so that the algorithm can pick up the channel and share it with more people. So with that, thank you again, and we'll see you next time.